Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. Prophet, my brethren, though a man say he has faith, and has not works. Can faith save him? Can, can faith save a man? Though he say he has faith, but if he has not works, and I like to fill that in with this, works of obedience. Because we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. But we know that if we really have faith, we're going to have works of obedience. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead. Say that with me. Faith, if it has not works, is dead. It's not faith at all. It's what? It's dead. That means it has no power and it's inoperable. When something's dead, it has no power. So you can say you have faith, but if you don't do the things that God says do, then it's dead. It's not faith at all. It's not true faith. Let me put it this way. True faith is evidenced by works of obedience. Say that with me. True faith is evidenced by works of obedience. That is the proof. The works of obedience is the proof that you have the faith. Abraham's works of obedience to God proved to God that Abraham had faith. When God said, go take Isaac, lay him on the altar, and offer him up to me as a sacrifice, what happened? Abraham believed God, and he obeyed God. So his faith in God was evidenced by his works of obedience. That's the same way it is with us, church. Our faith is dead if it doesn't have works of obedience. So true faith has to have works of obedience. I, I like the way Jesus put it. He said, be ye not mere hearers of the word, but be ye doers. Sometimes people have heard the word. And they know what the word says, but they don't do what it says. The Bible says, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders. And let the elders pray the prayer of faith over him and anoint him with oil and he'll be healed. But I see sick people all the time that are Christians, but they've never called for the elders to pray over them. They've never been anointed with oil. Uh, we're good about going to the doctors, and we're good about doing what the doctor says do, but what about the great physician? Are we doing what the great physician says do? Can I hear an amen? I'm giving you an example of what can happen. We can easily begin to deceive ourselves by saying we have faith when we do not do the works of obedience that we should be doing. Can I hear an amen? We can get in the place of self-deceived. The worst thing about deception is not so bad that somebody else deceive you, but when you're self-deceived, that's bad. And many people are today. God really expects us to do what his word says do. do. Do you believe that? That God really does want me to do what he says do. Amen? He really does want you and I to obey him. To keep his commandments. I didn't say law. I said commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Some people say they love God, but they do not do the things that he says. And that's proof that they don't love him. Because if you loved him, you would obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, then obey me. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. He said, in that great day that's coming, many will say, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not healed the sick in your name? Have we not done many great things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. See, many will call him Lord, but he really he's not Lord. When, when Jesus is our Savior, he saves us. He forgives us. He heals us. He cleanses us. He gets rid of our sin. But to become Lord means he's master and we obey him. Amen. There's a progression that takes place in a Christian's life. And that's where he not only becomes Savior, but he becomes Lord. Amen. That's when you start doing whatever he says. It means you daily practice. We know we're not perfect at it. I think we won't be exactly perfect when he comes. But listen, we ought to be being perfected. We ought to be more in conformity with his ways today than we were yesterday. And, and yesterday than before today. Because if we're not moving forward, we're falling back. Are you listening? If you're not moving forward with God, you're falling back. There's no place of standing still. Well, I'm just where I need to be and I'm going to stay like this. No, there constantly has to be a pressing forward. Amen. We have to continue in the faith. He said continue in the faith. Walk in the spirit. Walk means progressively make movement. Amen. Advancing in the kingdom. It takes consistently doing it because if you stop doing it, you'll start backsliding. Some people don't believe in backsliding, but read it in the Bible. Many people backslid. Many of Jesus' disciples turned away from following him in the last days because of persecution. Amen? So we don't want to get there, right? Let's read. Eighteen, yes, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. You show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James, James says, I'll show you my faith by what I do without saying a word. He could see he was going to be able to show people that he had faith in God by the way he lived and the way he conducted his life. Our life ought to be evidence by the way we live and the way we talk and the way we walk and the way we conduct ourselves on a daily basis that we don't have to tell the world who we are. They can look at it and tell what it is and that it's contrary to the world. Amen. The church ought not to be looking just like the world because we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Can I hear an amen? So a lot of the churches become to look like the world. But y'all, we're word people, not worldly people. Amen. We're in the world, but we're not of it. So he says, you believe that there's one God. You do well. And then he says this, watch this. And I hear this tune. I hear this tone. The devils also believe and tremble. So what that you say you believe? The devils believe. And they even tremble. But that doesn't make you a person of faith. What makes you a person of faith is because you do and obey God. Amen? That's what makes you a person of faith. We can say we have faith. But do we really have it? Do we, is our trust really in the Lord? Do you think that you're, you'll ever be tested? Do you think God will ever test your faith to see where it is? Everybody's head's going up and down. Because you've been tested probably many times by now, right? Amen. It seems like sometimes we go through seasons, it's just test after test. Sometimes you may feel like you're being tested beyond what you can even handle. Do you know that the disciples were? Paul said, we've been beaten, we've been thrown into prison, we've been left out in the ocean overnight. 
We've been hated. We've been mocked. He talked about the many things that he went through and the apostles went through all for doing what? All for doing right. All for obeying. So when I start telling you to obey God, I may be telling you that when you obey God, you may have some trouble appear because of it. And many people say, well, I don't want no trouble now. I just want everything to go good, so I'm just going to be a nice little Christian and I don't want no more trouble. Let me tell you what, when you stand up for God, you're going to have trouble from the enemy. Amen? It may arise, trouble may arise, but so be it. If it's God's will that you have to take your stand for him, take your stand for him. Amen? Amen? Even so, I want to read that verse 17 one more time. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Faith cannot be alone or it's dead. It must have works of obedience to accompany it. Verse 19, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith what? Made perfect. So it's faith with his works of obedience and by his works of, obe of obedience was his faith made perfect. It applies to us too. When we say we have faith and then we have works of obedience, then our faith is perfected. Amen? It's real, true faith. Amen? Um, and the scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for what? righteousness so he was justified by faith we're all justified by faith but when you say the word faith it automatically cannot be alone it must have what works of what obedience Abraham had to do what God told him to do just like you and I have to do what God tells us to do he expects it. See, if you don't know what Father expects of you, then you won't know what to do. But when we read God's Word, we come to knowledge of what God expects of us. So we need to know God's Word very well to even know what He expects of us. Amen? You see then how that by works... A man is justified and not by faith only. Now, this is a tricky... Some people say, well, that contradicts what Ephesians 6 says. That's contradictory because we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Here's the easiest way to see it. Faith must come first. Believing God, trusting God, depending on God, relying on God, and then works of obedience follow. That's true faith. But many think that they're justified with God by working for God or working trying to earn their salvation. Many denominations are out there trying to work for their salvation this morning. There's entire denominations, bound up people, working, going door to door, handing out the watchtower, doing all of these works because they're told that heaven is full, that the, the 144,000 that could come in is already in there. So now they have to work their way into heaven. And y'all, there's so many people deceived. They're deceived and they're not saved. They're not born again. They're not where they need to be in Christ. And for me personally, that is sad. I hate that there's so many people bound up in dead religion under false teachers and false prophets who are one day going to stand in judgment before God and hear him say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. 
There's coming a day of judgment where God's going to judge those who have falsely taught doctrine for doctrine things he didn't teach for doctrine. Doctrine is very important. Doctrine is simply Jesus' teachings. I mean, teaching the things that Jesus teaches is what we're doing. The apostles taught the things that Jesus taught them. And we teach the things that Jesus and the apostles taught us. All we're doing is we're teaching whatever the apostles and Jesus taught. Amen. Now we also have the Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. We teach what the Holy Spirit teaches us. Our teacher is the Holy Spirit. He reveals, he transmits, and he discloses truth to us. And this is how we know the truth. It's because the Spirit leads us into all truth. That's his job in your life as a Christian. Amen. Is to be led. God says, sees that we need a leader. And our leader individually is the Holy Spirit. And our leader corporately as a body is the Holy Ghost. I'm not the leader. The Holy Ghost is the leader of this church, of this ministry. God called forth this ministry. God said, let it be called. And God will sustain whatever he calls. Amen. He will uphold it. He will sustain it. And his will will be done in it. Amen. I mean, I'm so glad to be a part of what God is doing in the last days. And sometimes we feel like we're not a part if it's not big. Well, I tell you, the Word of God says, despise not the day of small beginnings. I mean, it doesn't matter. Israel, he said, you're the smallest. You're the ones that, you know, everybody says, you'll never be nothing. I mean, maybe people said that to you personally. You'll never be nothing. Well, God loves to take nothings and nobodies and do something with them. Amen? God loves to use the nobodies. I like that song. I'm just a nobody telling everybody about somebody that saved my soul. Amen? <laughs> Amen? That's who we are. I may be a nobody, but I'm just somebody that's telling everybody about Jesus who saved my soul. That's what we do. We are to proclaim his name. Amen? So we see that a man is justified, and justified literally means declared just and righteous in the sight of God. And a man is justified not by faith alone, but by faith with works of obedience. And then he takes us to Rahab the harlot. And he says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead also. I mean, we have to put feet to our faith. We have to put hands to our faith. See, some people say, well, God bless me. Well, God said, I'll bless the work of your hands. Okay, God's going to bless me. Yes, he will, but God's going to expect you to do some work. Amen? He said, I'll bless the work of your hands. Some people said, well, God's going to bless me. I'm just going to sit up here in my house and do nothing all day. We'll see if you get blessed. <laughs> it ain't going to work. <laughs> Amen? He said, I will bless the, the, the work of your hands. That's the covenant he made with Abraham, our father in the faith. He said, in the day of blessing, I will bless you. In the day of multiplying, I will multiply you. He said, I will bless the work of your hands. And so... Um, you know, we just have to know that sometimes God's saying, you know, if you need a greater blessing, find something to do with your hands. A lot of times there's ways we can increase ourselves if we just get a little creative. You know, there's ways to make money if we just ask God for some wisdom. Whatever your gifts are, come on, stay with me. Whatever your gifts are, they'll make room for you. What is your gifts? Find out what your gifts are. What are you gifted at? What do you do well? What can you do that nobody else can't do? What can you do? I, I've seen people that they cook well, and they begin to cook and prepare stuff and sell stuff. I've seen people bake cakes. They're just good at baking cakes, and other people ain't got time to bake no cake, but they're so happy to buy a cake from somebody that can bake a good cake. You can make some money if you want to. Come on, we can all make some money. It may not be doing what we think we want to do, but, amen, we can do it. I've pulled weeds in a flower bed before to make money, and it wasn't my own weeds either. It was somebody else's weeds. 
I literally have pulled weeds to make money before. I do not lie. I tell you the truth. Amen? It hurt my pride, but it, it paid at the end of the day. I had more money than I started off with. Amen? Pride will get you in trouble. Oh, I don't know. That ain't even part of my sermon today. I don't know. Maybe it helped us all to hear it, but um, mm. I want you to turn to Second Thessalonians chapter 3. God is good. God is good. God cares about us. And anything he tells us, he tells us because it's good for us. God never wants to hurt us or harm us. He only wants to do us good, but he's also a God that doesn't lie. He will not tickle your ears. I've had him reprove me, rebuke me, and everything else. He'll tell you sometimes things you might not want to hear. And he'll leave it there too. You can hear it or you can not hear it, but he'll leave it there. Second Thessalonians. Paul wrote this to the church at Thessalonica in his second letter in chapter 3. Verse 1, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all men have faith. Do you see men that have not faith are called here in the Thessalonians chapter 3? unreasonable and wicked unreasonable you cannot reason with them you know the scripture in Isaiah says oh come let us reason though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow amen see an unreasonable man doesn't have faith you cannot reason with him that he needs forgiveness or needs God or needs grace and he needs to have faith and works of obedience to receive it. You can't reason with unreasonable. And the word of the Lord here is wicked. Mm. You know, today in our world, we have a lot of unreasonable, wicked men and women who do not have the faith that you and I have in God. You and I, our faith is in God. Come on, our faith is in God, right? That's who we, that's who we love. That's who we trust. That's who we depend on. That's who we rely on. But there's a lot of people, they don't know the God we know. And they don't have faith in the God we know. Paul is asking as an apostle, as a minister of the gospel, that the church would pray for him to be delivered from them. These are the men that used to take them up and bring them into their synagogues and bring them into their courts and do all manner of evil against them and say all manner of lies against them none of it being true they were false accusers amen they they beat them they persecuted them they locked them up he was asking the church to pray for us pray for us to be delivered from these unreasonable wicked Men who have not faith. Mm. In Joel 2.23 this past week I shared. And in Joel chapter 2, Joel tells us of a time where there's going to be a former rain and a latter rain. And he says in Joel 2.23, Be glad ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord thy God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The, fo the floors will be full of wheat. The fats will overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. My great army that I sent 
among you, says the Lord. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And you shall praise the name of the Lord your God. For he has dealt wondrously with you. And my people will never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Now, if you study history with Israel, Israel had times where there was no rain. They would go months and months and months with no rain. The ground would be so hard that they could not plant. Anybody who farms knows you've got to have water. It's an essential thing. It is absolutely essential to life. Amen? It's essential. We have to have water to drink or else we'll perish, right? It's essential to life. Well, the, 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 the story goes that Israel had times where they went months with no rain. And they always looked forward to autumn, the month of October, and always into November a little bit because that was the time where God would send the rain. And when it rained, it would prepare the soil so the farmer could plow it and they could get the seed in the ground for their harvest. So that is what he's referring to, except in a spiritual manner, not it, it, it is a physical thing because God says, I'm going to bless you in your grain, in your wine, and in your oil. So it has to do with their prosperity and their well-being. Even he said, you're going to eat and you're going to have plenty of food. Amen? Because of the rain, the former rain. That's what the former rain is. It's the autumn rain. It's the October rain. What month is it? It's time for rain. It's time for God to rain down on us the Holy Ghost too because spiritually we will dry up and die if God does not pour out His Spirit on us. We need the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on us to live. Amen? He's the living water. Jesus said, drink. Amen? If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And this he spake of, of the Holy Ghost, that anyone who believed on him should receive. So drinking has to do with receiving that was is, which is essential to eternal life, which is the Holy Ghost. You must be filled with the Holy Ghost. If God's Spirit is not in you, you're none of His. Romans 8, right? So I want you to see in the physical how Israel depended on God pouring out the former rain in autumn so they could get the seed in the ground. Now, the latter rain. Joel promises that God's going to give not only the former rain, but he's going to give the former and the latter rain together in the last days. So, we're in the last days. Actually, the last days began on the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost was when Joel's prophecy was fulfilled. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the 120 believers were gathered together in the upper room in Jerusalem in obedience to what Jesus told them to do. What did he tell them to do? He said, go into Jerusalem and wait. Tarry there until you be endued with power from on high. Do not go out. Don't try to start your ministry. Don't go out and start to preach. Don't go lay hands on nobody. First, you must get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what Jesus said. So when Jesus died and he rose again and he ascended back to the Father, what did the disciples do? Did they go out immediately and start preaching? No, they didn't. They went directly to Jerusalem and they obeyed. If you love me, obey me. So they loved him. 
And they obeyed him, and they had to trust him. They didn't even know what this Holy Ghost looked like. They didn't know what the experience with the Holy Spirit coming was going to be like. They had had Jesus with them. But nevertheless, they obeyed Jesus, and they went to the upper room, and they stayed there. Imagine staying there for 50 days. Penta means 50. They stayed there for 50 days in an upper room. 120 believers gathered together in one mind, one accord, praying and worshiping and waiting for the Holy Spirit. Until one day, and that day was on the day of Pentecost. It says that suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Come on. He came from heaven. There was a sound come from heaven. And the Bible says that it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And, and the Spirit sat upon each of them. Now the Spirit came and sat on them. Come on, the Spirit came and sat on them. Where they were seated, just like we're seated here. They were seated in the house of God. I call it the house of God because there was more than two believers there. Amen. A house of God is anywhere where two or more are gathered together in his name. It can be in a house, a trailer, a car. I don't care where it is. There he's, is his house. Amen. He sat on each of them. And the Bible says next, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, this was faith. It takes faith to receive the Holy Spirit. When he came, they welcomed him. And they received him. And you know, he was just like Jesus. He was like Jesus. He was, Jesus said, you're going to know him because he's just like us. He's like the Father. He's like the Son, but he's not. He's the Holy Spirit. He's God. He's not God the Father. He's not God the Son, but he's God the Holy Spirit. He said, you're going to know him. And when he showed up, they knew him. They said, this is him. He came like a mighty rushing wind. He filled the house. He sat on each of them. And they said, we receive. And as they received by faith, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and listened to what works came forth. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them the language. And thus, the speaking in the tongues was the true evidence of the faith that they had received the Holy Spirit. All 120 spoke in tongues. Women and men. They were all speaking in tongues. And it was noised abroad. There was so much noise. They were dancing. They were shouting. They were singing. Shouting for joy. It was loud. It was not quiet that day when the Holy Ghost came down. And they were all diffused throughout their soul with power. From on high. Are you hearing me this morning? They were diffused in their soul with power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I tell y'all, that's power. When the power of God comes on you, that's power. There's no power in earth like the power of God. God is all powerful. And his power had come upon them, and they were now filled with power. They had Holy Ghost power living in them, and it changed who they were. It changed them. It gave them the ability to do the things they could not do before they received the Holy Ghost. They could not preach under the anointing. They could not teach under the anointing they could not heal the sick they could not cast out devils they had no power on their own to do any of that but once they received the gift of the holy spirit by faith then they spake in other tongues and they went on from there and they began to prophesy and if you remember finally they probably quit speaking in tongues and it says Peter stood up with the other 11 apostles and he says men and brethren these are not drunk as you suppose <laughs> reckon why he said that people said they're drunk this is crazy look at them crazy people they're in there jumping and shouting and they're speaking in some other tongue. It must have been something because Peter had to tell them that these people aren't drunk as you think. But he said, this is that 
that was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days I will pour out my spirit, saith the Lord, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall have visions, and upon my servants and upon my handmaidens will I pour out my spirit, saith the Lord, and they shall prophesy. He said, this is what's happening. This is the former reign of Pentecost. This is what Jesus told us was going to happen, and it's happened. Now, just as sure as I'm standing here this morning, there's a former and a latter rain got to come to bring in the final harvest. Because any farmer knows that you need another good rain to get the soil to, first of all, get the fruit to come forth, and then to be able to go in there and get the harvest out. That's called the latter rain, and that occurs in March to April. March and April, right in there. That's when the latter rain takes place. March or April for Israel. I'm speaking from Israel's perspective right now. So they had their seed in the ground, and then came March or April, and they needed another rain. And they would look to God to send that rain, because if God didn't send that rain, they lost everything that they had invested. Everything they had done would just be down the tube unless God blessed it and sent the rain. And so they would pray, and they would ask the Lord for the rain. They would ask God for the rain. And also they would sow an offering toward God. They would give unto God not to buy something from him, but to say, Lord, we honor you. And we're going to bring the first fruits of our increase into your presence and give it to you. And they honored God with the first fruits of all their increase. Every time they increased... They gave the first of the whole unto God. First fruits is different than tithes. It's the first of the whole. Whereas tithe is the tenth of the, of, of the whole. It's the first of the whole. But they would give their first fruits unto the Lord. Proverbs teaches wise sayings to bring your first fruits of everything, every time you prosper, Give the first unto the Lord. And this is what they did. They would give unto God in acknowledgement and in thanksgiving to God for what he had done for them. Even they would sow toward the Lord in expectation to receive. Do we do any different? When I sow, I sow in expectation to receive. It would be dumb to sow and not expect. What farmer ever sows something and doesn't expect to receive something. That would be a crazy farmer, wouldn't it? Could you imagine a farmer go out and spend an entire afternoon planting his garden, and then you said, or, you know, what are you expecting? And he said, I, I ain't expecting nothing in return. I, I just went out there and sowed all those seeds, but, you know, I'm, I'm not really expecting anything in return. Let me tell you what, when you sow into the work of God, when you give to the work of the Lord, you should expect something from God in return. Can I hear an amen? You can expect from God. And you should expect from God. In fact, God loves it when your expectation is on Him and you have no other gods before Him like the money gods. See, see the world, they trust in money. A lot of rich people trust in uncertain riches. Even Paul the Apostle said that we are not to trust in uncertain riches. They can be here today and gone tomorrow. Your nest egg could be gone before you even get to it. It is not sure that it's going to be there. But let me tell you what, God will never fail you. God will move heaven and earth to take care of you. He's promised that you don't have to take care of yourself 
if you'll love him and obey him and put him first, you won't even have to look after yourself. He'll look after you. When you put God first and you make him Lord of all and you honor him with the first fruits and with all your increase, you're not doing it to pay God. It's honor. It's called honor. Read it in Proverbs. It's called you honor him. Let me tell you what. Whom you honor, you have access to. Whom you dishonor, you have no access to. Who do you want, who do you want to have access to? I want to have access to God. Well, I need to honor him, right? Proverbs says, honor the Lord with the first fruits, with all of thine increase. Amen. Acknowledge him. Honor him. Amen. And give to God. So this is what the children of Israel did. They, they did good works. But also they expected from God, and God honored them. Let me say this to you. God will honor those who honor him. God will bless those who bless him. God will take care of those whose trust is in him and obedience to him. You cannot say, I have faith in God, but do not the things which he says do now. Come on. You can't go around saying, I trust in God with everything, and then you don't do what God says do. That's dead. That's not faith. But see, our, our mind gets in the way. That little voice of doubt, that little voice of unbelief. Well, can I really trust God? You know, he begins to try to make us doubt. Satan comes and tries to make you doubt God. We need to listen to the voice of truth. God said, my word is truth, my spirit is truth. Listen to the voice of truth. Amen. When you give unto the Lord, don't give it to people. Give unto the Lord. When you release something, if you were to release an offering to this church, you're not giving it to me. You're not even giving it to this church, per se. You are to give unto the Lord. And when you give something unto the Lord, amen, he's going to give. He's, he's just natural. He's just going to give back. Because if you, the scripture, Paul taught it. He said, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who sows abundantly shall reap abundantly. Why do we think there's common sense in that with farmers, but there's not common sense with that concerning the body of Christ? I mean, no, even if we sow, it's not going to save us, right? I mean, you can give all the money you got away to God, and, and if, you ain't, if you ain't born again, you ain't going to heaven. Amen? If you don't love God, and God's love's not in you, and God's spirit's not in you, you're not going to go to heaven anyway if you give all your money, so just keep your money. Amen? But see, money... The love of it is the very root of all evil. And because some have coveted after money, they've erred from the faith. Are you hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the house this morning? If you covet money, and that means to have an inordinate greed for it, to consume it upon your own lusts, if you covet money, it will cause you to err from the faith. You can't covet money and be in faith at the same time. But I'm going to tell you the truth. If you'll put your trust in God and honor God and obey God, you'll never lack for anything. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means be in lack for anything. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, when he's your shepherd and you're the sheep of his pasture, amen, and you're about your father's business, 
Amen. You live for Jesus each day just to honor him, just to do whatever he would have you to do. You just want to serve the Lord. You just want to get up today and be a blessing to somebody. You just forget about your kingdom in the earth, and you focus on his kingdom in heaven. Amen. To be about the Father's business. And you know what? God says, I'll take care of your, your stuff. You take care of my stuff, and I'll take care of your stuff. See, but sometimes we're taking care of our stuff and expecting God to take care of us too. God wants us to take care of his stuff. We want God to take care of our stuff. We want him to take care of us. Jesus said, I have to be about my father's business. Each day, we need to seek God daily and find out what he would have us to do each day so that we might be guilty of serving the Lord and not serving ourselves. Amen? Because we can, we can serve ourselves if we choose to. And that's where we live our life doing what we want to do with it and not, what, not caring what God has to say, not caring what God needs. I'm going to tell you what. God needs you. He needs every Christian Every member of the body, you are so needed by God. Well, what does God need me to do? Well, wake up in the morning. When you wake up tomorrow morning, first thing, say, God, I'm going to get up and give you praise and thanks today. And you can use me anywhere, anyhow. You need to. I'm here for you. If, if you need me to pray for somebody, if you need me to witness for somebody, if you need me to love somebody, if you need me to hug somebody, if you need me to give money to somebody, if you need me to feed somebody, whatever you need for me to do, I'm here. And if we'll just be here for God, see, that's all God wants. He wants us to just be about his business. He'll take care of our needs. He said, look at the birds. He said, look at the birds. He said, how much more valuable are you than the birds? He feeds the birds. How much more valuable are you than birds? Amen. We're more valuable than the birds. I don't have to worry about taking care of my stuff. I just need to be concerned about doing what God would have me to do. Amen? And he'll take care of everything else. Amen? Colossians 1, 21 says, You were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled you. We were once enemies of God's in mind. But, thank God, we've been reconciled. Who reconciled us to God? Jesus Christ at the cross. Amen. Had it not been for Jesus and his sacrifice, we could not be reconciled. In his body of his flesh, through death, to present us holy and blank, unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight. Let me tell you what. That's what's going to happen. For those of us who's put our faith in Jesus and what he did for us at the cross, he's going to present us to the Father holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. There's a day you're going to stand before the Lord, and because of Jesus... You're going to stand there unreproved. See, some people's like, I don't want to stand before God. I'm afraid he's going to reprove me. No, because of Jesus, you'll be unreprovable. Because of Jesus, you'll be unblameable. Because of Jesus, you'll be holy. It won't be because of what you did. It'll be because of what he did. But really, we do play a part in that. Because we must believe and we must obey the Lord in order to reap his blessings. Amen? God tells in Deuteronomy 28 that he blesses for obedience and the curses come as a result of disobedience. You know, I'm, I'm grieved. Many third world countries are so cursed and they live in such lack because they do not honor God and their grounds are dry and they cannot produce anything of their crops because they have not honored God with what they did have. They have not put God first. 
uh, many countries, even like India, 95% um, Hinduism in, in India, they worship other gods. And, you know, but God takes care of his own that are in there serving him and doing his work. And we are privileged to have that connection that we have there to help support the pastors that are there in India. Our ministry does an outreach to, to India, and we help them because they're doing the Lord's work there. And it's hard to do the, works, the Lord's work in India. You think it's hard in America. It's not hard at all in America to do God's work. You go somewhere like India, and you get beat up. You're riding your bicycle along down the road fixing to go preach, and all of a sudden somebody attacks you and beats you to t beats the tar out of you. I mean, we see that all the time in their pictures. They're constantly attacked for no other reason except for preaching Jesus' name, him being the way, the truth, and the life. Colossians says this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this verse, and then I'm going to share one more to close out this message. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, amen, which was preached to every creature under heaven, then Christ will present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable to God. If you what? If you continue in the faith. And watch what he says. Grounded and settled and be not moved away. Don't be moved away from your faith in the Lord. Do you know everything that comes against you is meant to move you? Why does trials come? They're meant to move you away from your faith in God. Why did the enemy do what he did to Job? He was trying to get Job to be moved away in his faith from God. He thought, well, I'll put all this on him. If I put all this on him, surely he'll quit believing in God. But he didn't. And you didn't. I mean, you didn't. You went through all kind of stuff, and it really made you stronger, and it made you need God more, and even we have to bless him for the trials we've been through, not for the sake of the trial, but for the place it brought us to where we've trusted in the Lord now. We've tasted of his goodness in the hard times. Amen? You, gotta, you, you get to the place where you bless God for your trials. Thank you, God. I didn't enjoy a one of them, but it brought me closer to you. That's what a trial does. That's what a test does. If, if you'll continue in the faith, amen, let, let faith have her perfect work. Come on, sometimes it feels like my faith is working on me. To try to believe God through this is hard. But that's okay. Job stood the test of time. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He continued to bless the Lord and it blows the enemy away. When you and I go through so much and then we turn around and bless the Lord and lift our hands and praise his holy name, it must blow hell away. Come on, it must just blow hell away when you just give him praise and shouts of glory and honor and praise because you've been through so much stuff. And they must sit there and wonder how do they continue to praise God? How does he continue to praise God with all this that's come against him? Paul says, your reward's coming. Continue in the faith. Don't be moved away. Be grounded. Be settled. And last verse I want to read to you comes from Zechariah 10, verse 1. And this is what it says. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain, every one grass in the field. You know, when the scripture talks about grass, he's talking about flesh. He's talking about us, the grass of the field. The flower is the glory of man. And the grass withers and the flower fades, okay? He says, I'll give rain to every grass in the field. It is time for us to ask the Lord for the rain, for the former 
and go ahead and ask for the latter. Because he says in the last day, he's going to pour out the former and the latter rain together. That means we're going to be sowing and reaping. We're going to be sowing and reaping. We're going to be sowing. We're not going to sow, wait six months, and reap. We're going to sow. We're going to be reaping. We're going to be sowing. We're going to be reaping. We're going to use both hands. Come on, the body of Christ has got to get ready to bring in this last harvest. It's going to be peak time. We got to bring the souls into the kingdom for the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Jesus said, don't pray for the harvest. It's white. It's ready. Pray for the laborers because I don't have many people willing to work in my wheat, in my fields, in my wheat field. He don't have many people working for him. Well, well, we sometimes think God's got plenty of people working for him. Don't all Christians work for God? No, they don't. Don't all Christians support the preaching of the gospel? No, they don't. Some people just want to get saved and get to heaven. And they care not about other souls out there that need to hear the gospel. But let that not be us. And if it is us today, let us humbly repent and amend our ways and say, no more. From now, for the rest of the days of my life, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to actually serve him. I'm not just going to love him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to do my very best to carry out whatever he tells me he needs me to do each day. See, you got to daily take up your cross and follow Jesus. But you can't do that till you deny yourself. We have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. That means we don't do with our life what we want to do. We do with our life after we've prayed and sought God what He tells us we need to do. And how often do we do that? Each day. Daily, deny yourself. Daily, take up your cross. Daily, follow me. That's Jesus' teachings. Now, are we living that way? I don't know because I don't know what you do every day. Now, I can tell you this. I'm trying to do my best to daily find out what God wants me to do and do that for him and live the life that he's called me to live, to live a godly life. I don't do it perfectly. I'd be lying to you if I said I do it perfectly. I don't do it perfectly. I wished I did it better, but I'm doing the best I know how to do, and I'm repenting and asking God to change me of the ways that I know when I shouldn't do it. Amen? But amen. We're going to continue in the faith, church. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more messages, to contact us, send your prayer request, or to make donations to support this outreach ministry, Go to lighthouseoutreach.org or download our app on iTunes, Google, or any Android device. If you're ever in our area, we invite you to visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84, about seven miles west of Ross Clark Circle in Dothan, Alabama.